This is Current Yield, the Grant's Interest Rate Observer podcast, and uh, I am Jim Grant, and uh, I don't know, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, joining me today, as always, Eric Whitehead to my left at the controls, Phil Grant across from him. Phil is the editor of Almost Daily Grants, which you should read almost every day. And sitting directly across from me is the great Evan Lorenz, deputy editor of Grants. So, ladies and gentlemen, today what we got is not one guest. Uh, we haven't got any paid commercials, although you'll be hearing from our own John Delberto later on the necessity of subscribing to grants. And uh, so the plan is uh, evident. I don't know. The plan is just to keep talking till we say something smart, right? Yes. So we, we could be here for a long time. This could be a protracted episode of Grant's uh, podcast, the current yield podcast. Trial and error. Right. Correct. So, But Learning I want to start with, with something entirely substantive, which has to do with interest rates such as they are. And text from which I preach today is, uh, is a tweet. Thanks to you, Jesse Felder, for this. And uh, Mr. Felder writes, normally when unemployment is this low and consumers feel this good, and I must say parenthetically, they feel about as good as they felt in many a moon, the Fed funds rate is positive in real terms by at least 300 basis points or three percentage points, not today. So Evan, this is a test. So the Fed funds rate today is, uh, is 175 to 2%, no? Yes, correct? that's correct. And uh, the inflation rate, uh, you make it to be... Uh, Over 2%? Yeah. So that would say that the uh, real Fed funds rate is a big fat goose egg, no? Yeah. As opposed to the three percentage points of Fed funds rate that we would have if things were uh, hunky-dory, as we at Grants would find that. I think that's fair. Okay. So, uh, so that is, in fact, a very important observation. And I shall now favor you, ladies and gentlemen, with something that uh, we rarely do in this podcast, which is a piece of wisdom plucked from the pages of grants, which generally uh, such wisdom is available only to the paying clientele. But for you on this podcast, here it is. David Hume, the great Scots philosopher of the 18th century, posited in about 1750 that, uh, and I paraphrase, no man will accept of low interest when he can have high profits, meaning there's an arbitrageable difference between the rate of interest and the rate of return on business enterprise. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let us uh, quickly survey the present landscape. So we have uh, very low rates of interest. No, in fact, in Europe, we have uh, still what, 6.9 trillion. Yeah, that, that's Europe and Japan and around the globe, $6.9 trillion worth of uh, sovereign debt that has a negative yield on it. All right. That's a low rate of interest, uh, low rates of interest. And even when they are positive, these rates, they're not... Um, positive by much, as we've seen with the Fed funds rate. So we have low, low, low rates of interest. Evan, tell us about corporate profitability. Well, as a percent of GDP, it's near all-time highs. This is America, of course. It's doing great. And as uh, Donald Trump uh, recognized yesterday, um, the S&P 500 hit a new all-time high. Did he mention that? He did, just once or twice. No. It also seems like prices are kind of picking up uh, around the country. This is from Markets Flash PMI. I'm quoting, average prices charged by private sector firms increased at the sharpest rate seen in the nine-year survey history. Service providers signaled a particular particularly steep rise in output charges in September, uh, which they commonly attributed to pass through higher labor costs and increased prices for inputs sourced from abod abroad. Well, uh, the wait for inflation has been a very long wait indeed, but we have had one species of inflation, one, one type, right? We have a, um, this is a little contentious, but uh, uh, we've had a magnificent bull market almost across all asset classes. And the question, I guess, before the House is, uh, to what degree does the uh, elevated level of stock prices present a risk to American growth? Uh, it's a kind of a paradoxical question because high equity prices would seem to uh, augur more growth, right? They're going, stock market's going up, stock market looks ahead. It's bullish, period. Bernanke claimed that on TV in uh, 2010. Well, he had eight years of uh, being correct ahead of him, which is a pretty good run for a PhD, you know, from Princeton. Yeah, it's a, I have to say it's pretty I have before me a new uh, comment by Stephen Blitz, who is a most excellent thinker about uh, economics. He now applies his trade at T.S. Lombard, and he has written something called The Equity Risk to U.S. Growth. And the highlights are as follows. Equity markets have rallied, notwithstanding uh, certain disruptions in global trade, that households are driving the market to record heights and to a record percent of net worth relative to real estate. So household net worth is unusually concentrated in equities as opposed to houses. Point three, non-financial corporations are using equities to reach near record leverage, that is leverage as a percentage of cash. And four, anyway, the four is speculation. But Evan, um, this would seem to, uh, to, uh, to kind of block the Fed in. In fact, uh, uh, Steve Blitz here kind of says that uh, the Fed has got itself into a, 
inflation trap. Meaning that it has to keep asset prices inflated. Yeah. The, 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 he says, I think he says at one point, uh, Steve, that uh, the country can't afford a bear market. I mean, what do you make of this? I, I don't really buy it. For one, in terms of households' wealth being concentrated in equities, if you look at the distribution, um, there was a paper out by New York University economist Edward Wolf uh, late last year that said the top 10% of households own something like 84% of all stocks. If you look at what the biggest component of wealth is for most you know, Americans, it's the house, house prices. So I, I, it, equity is very concentrated in kind of the wealth do. And if that falls off, it's not really going to crash America. Two, Hoisington Asset Management's done a lot of work on this. The wealth effect, which is the idea that as as your net worth increases because of, you know, paper uh, gains, you'll spend more, is not really borne out by the evidence. Uh, If you look at academic papers that uh, try to do surveys of this in the U.S. and other countries over the last couple of decades, the the link between, you know, gains in paper wealth and consumer spending is is pretty... Well, you know, the uh, the fruit of QE was very slow in, in ripening, right? I mean, the stock market went up it was the bottom of 10, 11, it, was, it began yeah. to take off. And, and uh, we've had some fabulous years. And only recently, with the accession of Vice President uh, Pence, did, <laughs> did I speak as an Indiana University alumnus. There you go. Yeah. All right. Pence doesn't get enough credit for this, nor, by the way, does the lovely Melania. But anywho, um, uh, the, please help me here, Evan. <laughs> The other thing I'd throw out there is the Fed is worried about whatever we're worried about at the time. So if you remember in um, in late 07, Giselle Bundchen, the supermodel, yeah. Yeah. she demanded to be paid in euros, not dollars, because right. the dollar was crashing. And of course, everyone was yeah. negative on the US dollar. Top ticked it. And if you actually look at the uh, the Fed's minutes from the June 24th to 25th, 2008 meeting, this is three months after Bear Stearns was bailed out by the, the Fed in a JP Morgan you know, assisted sale. And this is three months before Lehman's going to fail. And, and they were going to go through the worst financial crisis in the history. I'm going to read a little bit of what um, Governor War said. Third, let me turn to inflation risk. Inflation risks, in my view, continue to predominate as the greater risk to the economy. This is right before we're about to go through the biggest deflationary as recession. As everyone knows now. Yeah, as everyone knows now. I mean, so, in fairness in fairness to Kevin Walsh, he's generally on the side of the angels in these things. And I think what this excerpt you've read shows is, is kind of just the limitation of human foresight. And, and I think it, it is a one or two sentence condemnation, as this quotation, of the Fed's pretense at fine-tuning the economy through anticipating the next thing, because it is no better than the rest of us. In fact, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's worse. It's worse than everybody else. Their crystal ball is about as good as ours, and they are worried about whatever we're worried about. So if we become worried about inflation, they'll be worried about inflation. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Oh, speaking of inflation, um, as uh, you were, Evan, um, I now have, in fr- I'm reading, we're reading from text today, and uh, I have in front of me a fabulous new study. It's called The History and Future of Inflation. This is a, um, a big fat report by Deutsche Bank Research. This is a major, major thought piece by Deutsche Bank. And um, I, Phil, you handed this to me, and I, I can't, I'm going to have to. I think the stat about UK housing, which goes yeah, back okay, to. Okay, so yeah. yeah. So uh, here is what Deutsche Bank has to say about uh, long-term inflation and the age of inflation in which we still happen to live. Don't don't even look, because I got this. I got this. All right. So uh, Deutsche Bank says that uh, the longest series of asset prices extant is that of UK house prices. It goes back to the 13th century. And uh, the findings are that uh, the prices of houses in the United Kingdom went up 0.4% a year on average from about 1250 to 1939. Then something happened. What might that be? What might that something be? Well, let's see. Uh, The Deutsche Bank analysts uh, talk about a demographic shift. I would say there's a monetary shift as well. In any case, what happens after 1939 is uh, that house prices in the UK went up at an average of 8% a year. A terrific discontinuity of what preceded it. Well, what preceded 1939 was, for the most part, uh, ages and ages of, uh, you know, the precious metals being the base and the money itself. So Britain goes off the gold standard. 1914 comes back on in 1925, finds the rate of exchange to be intolerable, goes off for good. 1931, eight years later comes World War II, the triumph of John Maynard Keynes in about that period. And lo and behold, something different, something very discontinuous happens in our monetary and interest rate affairs. So anyway, this this report by uh, Deutsche Bank puts this in wonderful perspective. I, I think that they are laying a little bit too heavily on the demographic aspect and not enough on the monetary theme, but uh, it bears reading if you can read it. What else, Evan? Have we said something smart yet? Or we have to... Deutsche Bank said something smart. Yeah, yeah right. Well, we had the, we had the, had the wit to... I asked them for it, yeah. yeah. So I'll talk, right. go ahead and so take the credit for that, yeah. Most of the credit goes to you. Well, okay, we're going we're gonna to close with something constructive. I have heard 
tacit complaints, scarcely spoken out loud by some people who say that uh, the Grant's interest rate observer is uh, is not with it and perhaps a little bit bearish. I No, I've, I have heard. Stop it. Once, yeah, once in a while. So I would like to, uh, uh, I have two things to say before we close. And before we hear from John Delberto, who's going to tell you a little bit of something about Grant's. Oh, 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 and, and the conference as well. So stay put, please. So the first thing I have to say is that uh, I'm going to quote an executive from the World Bank. And in fact, he's a president. And that World Bank now is a holding company. I got the World Bank Group president, Jim Young Kim. Quote, over the last 25 years, more than a billion people have lifted themselves out of extreme poverty. And the global poverty rate is now lower than it ever been in recorded history. One of the greatest human achievements of our time. So, uh, you know, uh, from time to time in our pages, we have observed that interest rates are the lowest they have been in 3,000 years. That's it's a fact, according to Dick Silla, the co-author of The History of Interest Rates, 2000 BC to the Present. And people say, well, well you know, yeah, the, 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 lots of things are the first in 3,000 years, right? Uh, the eradication of so much of extreme poverty is new. Uh, the iPhone's new. Uh, the hospital for special surgery is new, first in 3,000 years. So the question is... Is this age of inflation and ultra-low interest rates, medicated central banking, doctored interest rates, is this uh, part of this improvement or is this just another darn cycle in the human and especially governmental propensity to mess up money? Leave that hanging. Now, that's a question. And ladies and gentlemen, we solicit your questions. And uh, Eric Whitehead gave me this prompt before. It's, it's uh, Eric, look at me and tell me where, you, where the people send their questions. See, that's that's the voice of Eric Whitehead, podcast at grantspub.com. Now, you ordinarily know Eric as the uh, as the well-traveled Eric Whitehead who takes vacations in the most peculiar places. But here he has spoken. He's a native English speaker. So thank you, Eric. Thanks for that. And, and uh, uh, what else do we have to say? Uh, so we got uh, optimism, invitations to query us. Oh, the conference coming up on October 9th is uh, not just any conference. Eric, would you say, care to say something else? Would you care to say, and how? A little bit more spirit would be welcomed, Eric. Uh, I'll, I'll help. And how? This, this is the best conference ever. 35th anniversary. And what is new as of the p past week is the announcement, I, which I happen to make, that uh, the conference will conclude with a champagne toast to the readers of grants. So you get to hear um, Stan Druckenmiller, Jim Bianco, Eddie Chancellor, uh, Francine McKenna. I, I, the whole lineup is fabulous. And, um, oh, I have some inside baseball news on this conference as well. And then I was, uh, so I kept on pestering Bill Ack for a title for his remarks. And he, you know, it just, it was like he was composing a sonnet. I said, Bill, how about, because he's, he's going to have a new idea. He's going to, he's going to unveil a new investment idea for the, for the attendees. And nobody can get it except for the attendees. No, and I don't care whether you get it on Twitter. It won't be the same. So I said, uh, Bill, how about we title your remarks a new idea? You know what he said? He said, fine. It's descriptive. Yeah, so that was that. That concluded that bit of, uh, of man drama with regard to the conference. Good job. So we'll see you, we'll see you there on October 9th. And uh, so thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, the next voice you will hear will be the professional speaking voice of John Delberto. For he's been with us for what, 50 years? About 50 years. The time flies. We're having fun. Yeah. And John will tell you about some of the features of grass you may not be aware of and uh, another reason to uh, subscribe to this thing. All right. So uh, Eric, thank you. And uh, by the way, just keep talking, Eric, because that was great. Phil, thank you. Thank you, Evan. Till next time. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you especially. Talk to you soon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, a word from our sponsor. And uh, our sponsor in this case is uh, is John Delberto. Actually, he's an employee of Grants. He's the person who calls you from time to time to uh, thank you for subscribing, to uh, urge you to renew, uh, you know, like that. So John has been with us for a long time, and he knows what you might be missing if you've not signed on to the Grants Pub website. So John, please tell the paid up subscribers what to do. It's very simple. Just click the login button on the upper right-hand corner corner of our website, grantspub.com, click register and enter your email address and password. And if you want to be notified when the issue is published every other week, sign up for the Grants Dispatch also on the homepage. An email will let you know as soon as we publish every other Wednesday. So start there. It's fabulous, right? What what a package of goods. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, John, is, is it true? I gather it's true that uh, we have many who have not registered, even though they've paid for the whole shooting match. That is correct. Well, we'll do it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, also, while they're at it, they can sign up for uh, you know almost daily grants, which is yours for the asking. Exactly. There are other features on the website well, they, that we'll they cover can, in the future. Yeah, they can, they can well. right, come to the conference too, right? Is it, is it possible to sign up for the conference on the World Wide Web? It is indeed. Yes. Well, they ought to do that too, right? As long as they're up. Exactly. Well, John, thank you very much. And we will be talking with you from time to time because you know grants from the inside out and you know the people who subscribe to grants. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you 
um, I, I think just about every web podcast, I want you to tell the people just how, how great your employer do. is. Jim, absolutely. <laughs> You're hired. Again, thank you, John. 